Hey everyone, Tito here. So in my last Japan video, I traveled to the incredible city of Osaka. I visited some pretty cool places like Super Nintendo World, and of course, lots of retro video game stores, taking a look at the prices and picking up some pretty neat stuff. If you haven't seen that episode, I left a link in the video description so you can check it out later. But now it's time to pack up and leave Osaka and head to the next city, Kyoto. And I have to say, I was actually really surprised at some of the amazing retro games and consoles I was able to find in Kyoto. I think you'll be super surprised also, so stay tuned. Now, this entire trip was made possible by the amazing folks over at Seneco, but more on them later. Anyway, we hopped on the metro to catch yet another Shinkansen train. Now, one thing I noticed is that usually the platforms for long distance trains like the Shinkansen have these small shops where you can purchase drinks, snacks, and even full on bento boxes to bring with you onto the train. Again, it's little things like this that make Japan just super convenient. Kyoto is actually pretty close to Osaka, so the train ride was only about 20 minutes long. Once we arrived in Kyoto, we went to check into our lodgings, which is called the Hen Na Hotel, and the really wacky thing about this place is that instead of humans at the front desk, they have a pair of velociraptors to check you in. Well, animatronic ones to be exact. A lot of hotels usually have a way to self-check in, but this was the first one I've seen go with a Jurassic theme. Anyway, once we got our room and dropped off our stuff, we were off to our first stop in Kyoto, which just happens to be a short walk from the hotel, the Kyoto Tower. This was actually kind of a great way to start the trip to Kyoto in that we were able to check out all the various attractions in the city. There was this really neat interactive touchscreen that lets you select different sites and learn a little bit about them. You can even use the binocular stands and explore the entire city. I had a bit too much fun putting my phone camera through the lens, but this gives you a pretty good idea of what I was able to check out. All right, it was getting close to dinner, so we decided to walk to the train station and head to a place called Gion. So let's go. Now Gion is a historic geisha district and is definitely a place that has a very traditional look and feel. This district has a very different vibe from all the other places I visited so far with all the ornate lamps and traditional buildings and roads. One of the major places to visit while in Gion is the Yasaka Shrine on the east side of the district. The sun began to set, which really made for the perfect time to visit. All the lamps were illuminated, and it just looked amazing. And so ends our first day in Kyoto. Now since we didn't do any game hunting on our first day, I wanted to get an early start for day two and hit the video game shops early. So like many of my mornings in Japan, I went to the nearby convenience store to grab a coffee. You probably heard this by now, but Japanese convenience stores are simply amazing. They have a huge assortment of drinks and great tasting food. Anyway, I grabbed some coffee, and now it's off to our first shop. So we hopped on a train to the Fushimi Ward of Kyoto. Once we arrived, it was a small hike to get to the shop, and I immediately noticed that we were in a much more suburban setting. It was almost like walking through a small neighborhood, and honestly, it was a nice change of pace. Well, we finally arrived to the first store of the day, called Ojamakan Fukakusa. Walking inside, you immediately see all the modern games, but in the back is where we found all the retro stuff. The selection wasn't huge, but they do have some interesting things, like this Game Boy Advance SP, which for some reason is kind of expensive. I'm not sure what the labels say on it, but it was more expensive than the boxed Vita and the Funtastic N64 behind it. They also had a small selection of junk bins. There were a couple Mega Drives and some other Sega consoles here for a fairly decent price. Now, here was something that piqued my interest. As you all know, I'm a huge Resident Evil fan. So while here in Japan, I've been contemplating picking up some Japanese versions of my favorite entries in the series, so I may come back and pick this one up later. And here's something that actually really surprised me. I saw this copy of Seiken Densetsu 3, known as Secret of Mana here in the US, which had a pretty high price tag. The reason this surprised me is because I actually have this very game and I got it for super cheap. So I researched it, and it seems that this particular copy of the game is what's known as a sample cartridge that is usually sent to the press for review. Pretty cool. Now hiding here is what appears to be a 3DO. I think this is a Panasonic FC10 model, which at this price is a pretty good bargain. Kinda wish I picked this one up. And not too far from the 3DO was a very expensive PC Engine Duo R. Yikes. 
Anyway, having checked out the store, we worked up a pretty good appetite, so we stopped by a local ramen shop to fuel up before our next activity. Checking out the Fushimi Inari Shrine, which sits at the base of the Inari Mountain. I'm sure you've seen photos of the shrine before with all the orange torii gates that preside over the entire trail leading to the summit of the Inari Mountain. So our plan, which seemed like a good idea at the time, is to follow the trail all the way to the top of the mountain. But little did we know that hiking the entire trail would be a fairly big undertaking. Regardless, the decision was made and off we went. It was incredible to see just how many gates were constructed for this path. They literally go all the way to the top. I've read that there are over 10,000 of them in total. Pretty incredible. Every so often, they will have these little rest areas where you can buy drinks and take a break, as well as smaller shrines that you can visit along the way. Now, there was this nice rest area pretty close to the top, and I took this opportunity to snap a photo of one of my pickups from the game store that we just visited. I wonder if this is the first copy of Biohazard 2 to make it this high up the trail. Anyway, we made it to the top, and we were exhausted. So we made our way back down to head to the hotel. But it wasn't long before we hopped on another train to make our way to the next and last retro video game store of the day. This is the Shimogi Award of Kyoto. It's definitely a really pretty and lively part of the city. After walking through the streets, we finally found what we were looking for, a Surigaya secondhand shop. And this place turned out to be a real gem, and you'll see why in just a moment. To start off, they had some pretty rare GameCube accessories, like these D-terminal digital cables, as well as a broadband adapter, both rare accessories in their original packaging. This Mother 3 Game Boy Micro, while amazing, was commanding a pretty huge price. On the other hand, this fully boxed SP was about 120 bucks and didn't seem like too bad of a deal. If the console was in good condition, and if it came with all the inserts and manuals, this could be a pretty solid pickup. This copy of Biohazard 2 for the GameCube was calling my name. At less than 50 bucks, I think this could be a pretty good deal. They even had Biohazard 3. Getting these both were very tempting and had me thinking about going for a full set of mainline Biohazard games for the GameCube. But nothing could prepare me for what I was about to find next. In the glass display case, in this Surigaya, there was a Game Boy Pocket. But not just any Game Boy Pocket. The extremely rare Imagineer variant that wasn't sold in stores and was only available in Japan. You actually had to win this console through a competition playing the Nintendo 64 game MRC. Elliot from the Retro Future actually made a fantastic video covering this exact Game Boy, so I would definitely check that out if you're interested in learning more about it. According to his video, only 2,000 of these were ever produced. Needless to say, this thing is rare, and its price reflects that. But even at 130,000 yen, or roughly $930, this is actually not that bad of a deal considering that they sell for way more. And if you thought this day couldn't get any more interesting, to top it all off, I was able to meet up with Jan, who is the owner of the company that you may all be familiar with called Consoles For You, which is based out of Switzerland. I actually made a video showcasing his version of the GBA HD, which you should definitely check out. It's just so amazing that we were here at the same time and were able to meet up. Just a really great guy. Now Jan actually bought the Imagineer Game Boy, and needless to say, I was a bit jealous. But it's definitely going to a good home. And on that high note, ends this incredible second day in Kyoto. Now you don't need to travel all the way to Japan in order to score great deals on retro video games. Sendico is an online service that helps you shop on Japanese websites and bid on Japanese auctions. They hold and consolidate all your orders in their warehouse until you want them shipped right to your door. They package them with care and ship all your orders in a single box directly to you. I use Sendico all the time and have always had a fantastic experience and found some killer deals on retro video game consoles. The folks at Sendico have made this entire trip to Japan possible, so I want to give them a huge shout out for sponsoring the trip. Check out the link in the description to get started with Sendico so you can find your very own retro gaming deals. Alright, now our third day in Kyoto was pretty low key because we were so exhausted from hiking the Inari Mountain the day before. But we still managed to take in the sights and of course, hunt for some retro video games. Now it just so happens that there is a small store called Comic Shock right by our hotel, literally just a 5 minute walk. 
While it primarily focuses on manga and other books, as you can see right in front of the store they had large bins of retro video games. The selection wasn't huge and I really didn't find anything here, but it was kind of cool that we had a shop so close to the hotel. Anyway, we really wanted to utilize the time we had left in Kyoto, even though we were pretty sore from the hike. So one of the places we had on our list was to check out the Nijo Castle. Not only were the buildings impressive, but the gardens were very beautiful. Definitely recommend visiting if you ever find yourself in Kyoto. And just a stone's throw away is the Kyoto Imperial Palace. The grounds of the palace is actually really big and is almost like a large public park in the middle of Kyoto. We even had the opportunity to tour the inside of one of the main buildings, but unfortunately we weren't permitted to film inside, which was a bit of a bummer. But very much like the Nijo Castle, the grounds of the Imperial Palace were quite beautiful and very well cared for. Now after doing a bit of research on other places to pick up retro video games, I came across a book off located at the Sanjo Station. This place actually had a decent selection of games and consoles, but wasn't quite as good as the Surigaya we visited yesterday. This box, Pokemon Green, I've heard is one of the more rare mainline Pokemon games for the original Game Boy, was actually pretty fairly priced, but the box wasn't in the greatest condition. There was also a small selection of Mega Drive games, but I actually didn't end up picking any, which I do regret because during the whole trip I didn't pick up any Mega Drive or Sega Genesis games. This broken Game Gear was pretty fairly priced at roughly 32 bucks, and I'm sure we can all guess what's wrong with this unit. I actually really enjoy refurbishing broken Game Gears and kinda wish I picked this one up so I can bring it back to life. I've so far seen quite a few Vitas, and these seem to be going for pretty decent prices. I actually really dig the Japanese Turtle in Time box art, but at over 200 bucks, this is a pricey one. Man, these Ninja Turtle games are super expensive. This copy of Return of the Shredder for the Mega Drive is over $370. This was actually released in the US under the title Hyperstone Heist. It's crazy how expensive even the Japanese version is. There was also a pair of super cheap GameCubes, but one couldn't read a disc. This would have been the perfect candidate for a Pico Boot mod. So our last stop was actually in a mall, and it was another book off, but this was a sort of spin-off store called Book Off Plus. This place turned out to be a miss because they only had modern games, but I did manage to find a 2DS. One of the really cool things about this mall was that it had a Tower Records, which was quite the nostalgia rush. Does anyone even remember Tower Records? Let me know down below in the comments. I just love how Japan somehow still has all these old retail relics. Anyway, that was about as much hunting as we could muster on our last day, so we grabbed dinner, thus concluding our last night in Kyoto. But being in Kyoto, we had to do one more thing, which was an absolute must. So on the morning of our fourth day, before leaving to our final destination of Tokyo, we went to a pretty special place. Any guesses? Yep, we had to visit the Nintendo headquarters. I just couldn't leave Kyoto without visiting this place. So we made the small trek. I've seen photos of these buildings numerous times, but it was certainly something else to see it in real life. Well guys, that wraps up my stay in Kyoto. Now the next episode in this Japan series will be in Tokyo where I actually purchased most of my pickups, one of which is a grail that I've been looking to get for a long time. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss that. I also have some really great mod videos coming out very soon, so make sure you have the notification bell turned on. And as always, see you all next time.